lightning, beautiful, powerful, five times hotter than the sun, and deadly. Lightning is essentially a very, very large spark. How does lightning kill? Destroy the brain, destroy the heart, destroy the nervous system. You really don't want to be on the receiving end of it. It's a million to one I did survive. I should not be here talking to you right now. I should be in a box 10 feet under. Lightning is determined and talented. That tree you've chosen to shelter under, it can bounce right off it and into you. The loudest bang I've ever heard in my life. Thought you'd escaped a direct hit? It can shoot along the ground you stand on and up through your feet. It was staggering smoke emitting from his body. It can even get you in the safety of your own home. I took 140,000 volts through my left ear. With the tremendous amount of energy and light and heat, it's just incredible to think that people survive lightning. Oh. My hair was burnt off, my shoes were blown open, the ends of my toes were burnt. It entered my body somewhere and came out my body somewhere and, and stopped my heart. Struck by the world's number one natural killer, the odds stacked firmly against them. How did they survive? The power of a thunderstorm matches that of a nuclear bomb. Lightning is its ruthless foot soldier, killing more than a thousand people worldwide every year. Right now, there are 2,000 thunderstorms raging across the skies. 100 lightning bolts are striking the Earth every second. That's 8 million chances to be hit every day. It travels at 100,000 miles a second, so you can never see it coming. Once lightning hits something or someone, it releases a deadly electric current. It measures more than 20,000 amps, thousands of times stronger than the current at home. It's this current that kills. We know from many studies that the real cause of death from lightning is cardiac arrest at the time of the injury. Lightning kills because somehow a current flows through the human body. And that current flows near or through the heart and it affects the nerves that actually make the heart beat. It stops the heart. Certainly a direct strike to the heart would not be a good one, or a direct strike to the brain would be deadly. It's mind-boggling to me that anyone could survive such a powerful force of nature, but they do. Michael Utley is a lightning survivor. Four years ago, he was hit by a lightning bolt that left him for dead. He fought for his life in intensive care for over a month. I don't have any memory of that day or actually the 38 days that follow. I was told there were thunderstorms and lightning off in the distance, but it, chance of getting struck by lightning, who gets struck by lightning? You know, nothing, it didn't bother me a bit. We probably shouldn't have been out on that golf course at that time. If you can see it 10, 12 miles away, it means it can hit you. In America, most golf courses know the dangers of lightning. They have early warning systems that kick in whenever it's around. The alarm went off about 30 to 40 seconds prior to the bolt of lightning. I was over very close to the cart, right here, just short of the cart. Heard the noise, the loudest bang I've ever heard in my life and I knew we were in trouble. I turned around. Mike was staggering, smoke emitting from his body, and he went down. They say my hair and eyebrows were burnt off. I have burns on the inside of my thighs. The tips of my fingers and toes were black. Damn scary sight. They said my shoes were blown off. My pants were kind of tattered. I know it blew my zipper open. And I have to say, I didn't think his chances of survival were very good. My heart stopped. I guess I was dead, but uh, that's a pretty substantial injury. Big smile. The first thing Michael remembers came 38 okay? days later. Okay. And I'm laying down and my arms are tied. I got a trach tube coming out and I got a stomach tube and I'm talking like the Godfather. And, I love it. and a big shadow and I look down and I'm like, where am I? 
And this guy looks up at him and laying down, and he looks up at him and he says, you're on your way to rehab. I said, what happened? You were struck by lightning a month ago. Michael's survival has left him with many questions about what happened to him that day. In his search for an explanation, he's visiting the world's leading lightning experts. Why don't you come over here and we'll have him talk some more. When you get struck with something of that force and you survive, you need a reason, you need an explanation for it. How did it happen? Why am I alive? Michael's survival is an incredible story because statistically, he shouldn't be alive. This is the worst case I've ever seen. Wow. What's the science? Have we found, we haven't found out. We don't know why I've survived and, and others didn't. Michael Utley was struck by lightning playing golf in Cape Cod, America. It left him close to death and in intensive care for over a month. How Michael survived a blast from nature's biggest killer is a mystery, but a mystery he wants to solve. It's a powerful event, and there's got to be a reason that you survive it. Well, what is it? I don't know. Bye-bye. To understand how he survived, he needs to know more about his assailant. At Manchester University, they can recreate lightning bolts that behave in exactly the same way as the real thing. Dr Ian Cotton believes that lightning is such a successful killer because it's so versatile. Lightning can get you in many ways. It can hit you directly. It can jump out of an object such as a tree. It can actually travel through the soil, up through your legs, or even into houses. It doesn't just have to take one. It can take multiple paths. In his lab, Ian Cotton will recreate each type of lightning strike. He'll compare their known effects with the circumstances of Michael's strike and find out if that will shed any light on how he survived. The first and most obvious type of strike is the direct hit. It's the most powerful type of lightning strike and delivers a massive electric current to whatever it hits. In a direct lightning strike, we expect a lightning current between five and 200,000 amps. A direct strike is most likely to hit a person who's out in the open. The bolt contains 1.3 billion watts of power. The chances of survival if struck, almost zero. And for those who take shelter from the storm under a tree, they up the risk of being hit by the second form of lightning, the side flash. A side flash, so when lightning comes down a tree and then it comes out of the tree sideways into you. That can contain as much current as a direct strike because the current may all come part way down the tree and then all of the current may come out of the tree into you. But a side flash has its limitations. It cannot jump further than two meters from the tree or any other tall object it hits first. Unlike the third type of lightning, the ground strike. The ground strike can travel over a much wider area, in fact, too big an area to show in Ian's lab. While lightning strikes the ground, you have a high voltage, maybe a million volts. As we move away from the lightning strike, we have circles of equal voltage. So the lightning strike may be a million volts. Then this circle, 800,000 volts, 600,000 volts, 400,000 volts, and 200,000 volts. What that means is, if I stand with my feet together by a circle, both of my feet are at the same voltage, so the voltage can't drive any current through my body. If I turn sideways on, what that means is my feet are at different voltages. So now we've got a big voltage, maybe 100,000 volts, that can actually push current through my body. As the voltage from the lightning bolt is spread out over a wide area, a ground strike is less likely to kill people. But if there are lots of people around where it hits the ground, all of them could be injured by that one deadly strike. Many of these players were injured, but no one died. Surely they've got to call this off. In some circumstances, though, a ground strike is lethal. Animals, though, like cows, are much more vulnerable. Because look at where my feet are in comparison to the cows. The cows' feet are so far apart that there's a much bigger voltage difference between the feet. 
so more voltage flows through the cow past its heart and it can stop the heart. If that happens, dead. So which sort of lightning strike hit Michael? He was struck on a golf course out in the open at least 20 metres from any tall objects. Too far for a side splash to reach him. Could Michael have been hit by a ground strike? With a ground strike, anyone within 100 feet of the point of impact would have felt the effects of the ground current. Did his golfing partners feel anything? We were 30 to 40 feet from where the lightning hit. Didn't feel a thing. If it couldn't have been a ground strike or a side splash, that leaves only one option, a direct hit. But how did he survive such a massive blast of electric current? A trace of evidence was discovered in the ground where Michael fell, right next to his golf putter. There was a three and a half foot slash mark. Taken right out as though somebody did it purposely with some kind of a garden tool. And you couldn't have done it any cleaner, exactly. It was, it was easily three to four inches deep. There was no mark as they played the hole, so it must have come with the strike. It seems obvious that the putter was somehow involved in the lightning's journey from sky to earth. This is the, the putter that I did have in my hand when I got struck, and maybe that explains that you survive more because it hit me and ran up the putter. He slashed the ground and threw me that way. It's a logical path. In the lab at Manchester University, they can zap a dummy carrying a putter just like Michael's and establish how the bolt may have traveled. Did the bolt travel down through the putter and splash out, creating the gash in the ground? The lightning consistently travels via the golf putter into the ground. Was this what happened on the golf course on the day Michael was struck? He could have been hit by lightning, and the lightning travelled down his body, out onto his golf putter, and into the ground, and that could have caused the slash in the ground. If the lightning discharged down the metal putter, was it this that helped him survive? At home, Michael has been collecting stories for a website he runs, analysing the characteristics and similarities of every reported incident. He's noticed how often metal is mentioned in these accounts. I have alerts that I get when people are struck, and I do a lot of, I have a database on, on that, and so many times you see that, oh, he was walking and it struck his umbrella, or I hear that the lightning struck my chain or my gold watch, or, or a piece of jewellery I'm, I'm wearing. One person who believes that his jewellery played a major part in his lightning accident is this man, Campbell Gillespie. The chain and the cross were given to me by my grandmother. I never took it off for any reason at all. It was part of me until the day of the accident. He was jogging in a park in Liverpool with his two best mates, wearing his granny's good luck chain around his neck. Yeah, just, I don't remember anything of it, but... Uh... It must have been pretty bad. Mm -hmm. It must have been. Campbell is a lightning survivor. His strike left him in a coma for a week. At the brink of death, he was given his last rites. Today, he has ten metal plates in his face, is deaf in his right ear, has no sense of taste and smell, is forgetful and struggles to sleep. I've got a fair list of injuries, but uh, I'm here and I'm breathing, do you know what I mean? It was the hottest day of 2003. The three runners were out on their usual early morning training session when the weather suddenly changed. I remember running along and it just seemed to be getting darker. The weather changed almost immediately and like all of a sudden, the lightning. I think it was just an instantaneous brightness. What the hell, what the hell was that, you know? And the, the noise of it was just, never heard nothing like it. The blast is like a flash gun going off in your face and then the blast hummed this way. Campbell was on the floor, and I shouted his name, and then I, I shook him with my foot to, to see if I get any response. Campbell didn't respond. As his friends stood over him, they saw that the lightning had left its mark. When we turned him over, there was just a purple mark around his neck. And he remember seeing the burn. The mark of the chain was burnt onto his neck. Campbell's chain had vanished, leaving a V-shaped burn. The cross was blown off of me. I had a severe burn round the neck where the chain was. You could still see part of the V. 
Is this mark around Campbell's neck evidence that the gold chain somehow saved his life? In this lab at Cullum Electromagnetics, they recreate the massive currents associated with a lightning strike. It's as destructive as the real thing. A leg of lamb is dressed with a similar gold chain to the one Campbell was wearing. 200,000 amps are driven through the carcass. Dump switches. Where will the current travel? Will the chain melt and what will happen to the lamb's flesh? That's quite a nasty burn, isn't it? It's clearly burned in a very short period of time because it had dis disappeared. So what we're seeing here, we're seeing the line of the chain um, as, a, as a linear burn. The chain has disappeared, leaving a mark in the lamb very similar to the one around Campbell's neck. <laughs> Campbell will live with that scar for the rest of his life. But could his grandma's chain have saved his life? There's some evidence that having metal on the outside of the body may actually be almost like focal points for keeping some of the energy from going inside the body. Metal picks up that energy very quickly, holds on to it, heats up, and then slowly releases the energy, causing that burn. So if you're wearing a chain around the neck, then it's possible that that could divert the current around here and therefore bypass, for example, current flowing into the spinal cord. The metal chain conducts the current more easily than our skin. Maybe Michael's putter did attract some of the current, reducing the overall energy flowing through the lower half of his body. For Campbell, the chain may have been a significant factor in his survival, but he and his mates also feel that it may have been his undoing, the very reason he was struck in the first place. Campbell was the only one with jewellery on. The lightning went for the chain. That's how small the cross was that almost killed me. Whether there's messages from his grandmother with the being his grandmother's chain, I don't know. But there you go, she certainly got the message across if she was. <laughs> the joggers are convinced that Campbell's jewellery singled him out. Michael Utley is sceptical. I don't think anything attracts lightning. Uh, I think, you know, lightning is, is, a, is a phenomenon that is so huge that what happens is, is if you look at a storm, so many thousands of feet high and so many thousands of feet wide that a 30-foot house is minuscule. So how is holding up a golf club or, or anything else like that, you know, a, a major thing in it? In Manchester, Ian Cotton contests to see if metal has any influence on the destination of a lightning bolt. Here we've got two rods. This one is made of copper. This one is made of wood. If we put these the same distance from a high voltage electrode, which makes the lightning, then we can see, is the lightning attracted more to the metal one or to the wooden one? It's a lightning shootout. Is Michael right and the lightning won't choose to strike metal more than wood? Will Campbell's theory that metal attracts lightning be proved spot on? It has nothing to do with whether there's metal there. I used to wear a pair of earrings as well, and I was told if I had earrings on that day, I'd have been dead, because the lightning just went right through my brain. Whether you've got metal in your ears, in any of your clothes, is really an irrelevance. It conducts it. It doesn't attract it. It's five all. Proof that metal does not attract lightning. Wearing metal on your body has nothing to do with whether lightning's going to attract you or not. You know, even lightning rods don't attract lightning. They merely conduct it safely around the building when lightning hit the building. So metal only becomes relevant once something has been struck. Then, as it's a good conductor of electricity, lightning will travel through it. David Smitty Smith discovered this to his cost. Lightning travels the path of the least resistance, so I happen to be the least resistance, even though I'm big. David Smith used to work the switchboard at one of Florida's emergency call centers. I have to take this off. That headset does upset me. 
One August afternoon, as a severe thunderstorm hit the area and David got to work dispatching fire and rescue crews to those in danger, he became one of its victims. He took a blast from a bolt of lightning that melted his fillings, popping the crowns from his teeth and left him deaf in his left ear. We were super busy. Every line was lit. I answered this one call. There was a man trapped in a burning building. He couldn't get out. And I said, go get the fire extinguisher. At that point, I felt this humongous, almost like a sledgehammer in my head. I felt like my entire head had just exploded and was on fire. I just remember Bruce looking over my face, yelling, Smitty, are you all right? Are you all right? He was in shock, basically. And the way he was grabbing his ears and everything else, we kind of knew was he took the lightning in the ear. When lightning strikes a building, it can find its way into the highly conductive metal cables and pipes and go where it wants. Electric sparks generated by this Tesla coil behave in the exact same way as a lightning bolt. When it strikes this TV aerial, the electric charge zaps its way into the metal wires through the wall and into the TV. Sometimes it can cause massive damage. A strike to the hot water tank in this house almost flattened it. We see a number of injuries to people indoors every year, some because they're around uh, plumbing that's conducting it through the, the metal pipes, some because they're on their computer, also because people are talking on telephones, and the telephone is not grounded to a sufficient level to keep that instant of lightning from coming in and causing the injury. Lightning hit the phone line and went right straight through that one 911 line and nailed me. What happened to Dave, uh, first thing I did was go home and buy a cordless telephone. So the phone rings during lightning storm, you use a cordless. If we lose power in the house, don't answer the phone. We got an answering machine, so who cares? But how did Smitty survive? If somebody was wearing a headset in a building and they were hurt in some way by lightning, that will be less current than if they'd been outside and they'd been hit directly. The other currents would have gone somewhere else in the building. David Smith survived because the current had traveled so far along the copper wire to his headset that the electricity wasn't powerful enough to stop his heart. Like these cows next to a wire fence, David was the victim of lightning using a good conductor to get to him. So if a good conductor like metal is lightning's favorite path, can a bad conductor, like rubber, protect you? People often think if something is insulated electrically, so if there's some rubber between them and the lightning strike, then they'll be safe. Michael Utley was wearing rubber-soled shoes the day he nearly died. He knows how protective they can be. I've heard it said that it was the rubber sneakers that saved my life. There's a good possibility that I survived because of a pair of runners on that could have insulated me enough to, to basically let me live. Lightning travels through so many miles and miles of atmosphere and is so much power and so much force, I don't know, you'd probably need 10 miles of rubber to save you. It's time to put it to the test. Take a rubber-soled shoe, drive the current of a lightning bolt through it, how good will the insulating properties be? We're talking massive amounts of power, and even though the rubber has a very high resistance, are rubber sneakers a good protection for lightning strike? I wouldn't want to bet my life on it. Michael's rubber-soled shoes ended up just like this one. They offered no protection at all on that day and offer him no solutions as to why he survived. For Michael to fully understand the awesome power of his adversary, he needs to confront his fears and get up close and personal with it again. Michael Utley has survived the full force of a direct lightning bolt. He suffered massive injuries. He's had to relearn how to walk, ride a bike, even to swallow. His recovery has been remarkable, but four years on, he's still struggling with the effect it's had on his nervous system. I walk down the hallway, you see me coming, you look at me and there's something wrong. I'm, I'm, my balance is off, I'll stumble out, my shoulder will hit the hallway door or something. My sensory perception and, and whatever is off. Michael looks kind of normal and people often mistake his 
balance problem. They chuckle, and if, if I walk behind, I think maybe they think he's gone to the pub or something. But most of Michael's problems are hidden, relating more to how lightning has damaged his brain and nervous system. We talk about lightning being an injury to the nervous system. There's absolutely no question about that with what we see clinically. Unfortunately, these changes don't show up uh, on CAT scans and, and regular MRIs. What lightning does is on a much more microscopic level, we're not exactly sure. We like to use the analogy of a laptop computer. If you pour a, a Coke on it, you can clean it up and it looks fine, but it doesn't run the same way it did before. Michael has decided to go to one of America's most respected pain clinics. He wonders if his injuries might hold the key to how he survived. For the first time, he will establish just how severely his nervous system has been damaged. Mike, this is a sensory test. Electricity typically damages the sensory nerves, so you can't feel touch, you can't feel temperature, you can't... The sensory nerves are the nerves that carry the information from the body all the way to the brain. The brain is probably the most susceptible organ that would be affected most by a lightning strike because it's made up of the most nerve cells. And if you alter the brain in any way, shape, or form, you've actually altered the being, if you will. And what I'm going to do is put electrical current in just to the point where you begin to feel it. So what you will do is you'll tell me where you feel the test. 40, 50, 60. Can you feel thing? 100. Most people will feel this at 30. Mike is now at 150. So already we have fairly clear-cut demonstration that Mike's sensory capabilities are virtually obliterated. We're now at 200. I don't feel a thing. I know, and that's worrisome. Your memory may change your personality, your ability to relate, whether you're irritable or not irritable, whether you are happy or not happy, all can be influenced by minor damage to the brain. Not even flinching as we approach 300. You 10 times. No. I don't feel a, I know. a thing. This is really profound loss, 400. We've now gone to 500, no sensation whatsoever. Nothing. The changes in my brain are noticeable. The ability to multifunction has been severely changed, if not completely gone. Now, interestingly, watch his finger. So he's getting enough electrical current to make his muscles jump, but he's not feeling anything. Well, So it's working me. on the motor component, but not on the sensory component. I could be talking on the phone to you, and, and my wife would say, hi, hon, I'm home, and I have to stop, turn around, say, hi, honey, boom, boom, back to you, re-engage, possibly reread a paragraph or two type scenario, and, and start over again. So I lost the question. 600, no response. People begin to feel sensation at 30. He's now at 700 millivolts, nothing at all. 800 millivolts, no sensation. Nelson Hendler has treated many lightning strike survivors, but Michael's tests have left him stunned. Uh, the tests that we did on Michael were unusual. I wasn't expecting to see quite the profound amount of nerve damage that we found. He's gone all the way to 999 millivolts, and he still has no sensation in his finger. It's not produced any electrical impulse. This is ab absolutely probably the worst case I've ever seen. Wow. Whilst Michael looks much the same as he did before the accident, inside his nervous system is ravaged. Could this pattern of injury be a clue to how he survived? Mary Ann Cooper has been studying the injuries of lightning survivors for 25 years, but in her role as an A&E doctor, she treats another group of victims of high voltage electricity, victims of industrial electrocution. They receive similar amounts of electricity, but have very different injuries. The effects of high voltage electrical injury as opposed to lightning injury are fairly different. For one thing, with high voltage electrical injury, you see incredible deep burns, cooked muscle tissue, major amputations. With lightning, the burns tend to be quite superficial and quite minor compared to the other things that we see. Could the clue to Michael's survival lie in the difference between these two types of injuries? There are several factors that make lightning injury far, far different than high-voltage industrial accidents. 
Probably the one that's most important is the time that lightning's actually around a person, which may be only a few thousandths of a second. I will, I'd much rather be a lightning victim. The lightning victim doesn't have the problems that the electrical shock victim has. And I think it has to do with duration. A few thousandths of a second is almost inconceivable. Maybe this is the reason why lightning can do so little visible damage. To test this theory, take one melon, zap it with the current of a lightning bolt for one millisecond. If the theory is correct, the melon should remain unscathed. While milliseconds sounds like a very little bit of time, we're talking 10 million volts through the body in a millisecond. And that's a lot of electricity, a lot of little electrons flowing through the body. The physical effects are dramatic. If the lightning current turns this melon into a fruit smoothie in just one millisecond, there has to be something more than duration to explain why Michael survived. Here's something five times hotter than the sun, a couple hundred thousand amps and millions of volts, and it blows buildings apart. It's a huge, huge phenomenon. How did I survive? The theories of doctors, the experiences of other lightning survivors, and the experiments in lightning labs have all left Michael baffled. It's time to turn to physics. The resistance of human body is about 700 ohm. So Professor Vladimir Rakov works with formulas. The current splits inversely proportional to resistance. He has accurately measured lightning voltage and current. D and in the parentheses D plus. values for resistance and conductivity and can work out how lightning travels when it hits a human body. Uh, lightning usually terminates on the highest point of the human body, which is the head. And the results of his calculations are rather surprising and can all be summed up in a single word, flashover. Potential difference will be high enough to produce a flashover, what is called flashover, that's an electrical arc. Most of the current will switch to the arc and as a result, human body receives only a fraction of the total lightning current. In simple terms, the flashover effect means when lightning strikes a person, only a proportion of the electric current actually travels through their body. Put another way... If I was going to explain it to a grade school uh, child, for instance, what I'd say is it's like this tremendous amount of water or energy coming down and like a shower, it hits the person and it flashes over and redistributes around them rather than going through them like a bullet would, for instance. But what are the figures? By how much does flashover reduce the current through the body? This uh, flashover will protect you from the total lightning current. As current rises, it can only rise up to 1,000 amps or so for a few microseconds duration, after which current will prefer to follow this path primarily. Only a small fraction of the total current will continue flowing through the body, and that current level is of the order of 5 amperes. So the flashover phenomenon means that 99% of lightning's current flashes over the body, leaving just 5 amps to flow through the body. What kind of difference would that make when applied to another melon? If this flashover effect is the reason that Michael survived, this time the melon will remain intact. There you go, not a mark on it. But a melon can only hint at the relative effects of current on a human body. It is, after all, only a melon. What kind of impact would five amps have on a human? Flow of a human body. However, that fraction is still sufficient in many cases to kill a human being. It seems flashover alone is not enough to explain survival. What else should be considered from the day our survivors were struck? I remember the rain. It was a big storm that day. The rain on that day was, was the heaviest I've ever come across. It was just incessant, it was just non-stop bouncing off the deck. Maybe the rain needs to be considered. Could it affect the level of flashover? 
that if the person is wet, perhaps the flashover is different with them, perhaps the way the energy is conducted around them is different. Perhaps the wetness actually is protective in some way. Manchester University can test how rainwater may influence the path of a lightning bolt. First, a dry tube is filled with salty water. This represents the conductive fluids inside survivors' bodies. Then, strike the tube with a lightning bolt of similar size to a direct hit. This will show how the lightning could travel across a dry human body. While lightning does flash over the outside of the tube, some still thunders through its centre. Evidence that the lightning travelled this path is obvious. What we saw at the bottom of the tube was lots of holes being made by the lightning trying to get out. And that is similar to what would happen to your body. Again, at some point it has to get out. And it will often do this, say by your feet, make a hole in the skin and it will get out into the soil. But how will the lightning path differ when the outside of the tube is wet? Take an identical plastic tube and spray it with water to represent rain-soaked bodies. Will more lightning be conducted round the outside of the tube, illustrating the heightened level of flashover? When we have the tube that's wet, the lightning travel down the outside of the tube. So if you are wet in a thunderstorm, lightning is more likely to flow on the surface of your skin or on your clothes than it is to actually go inside your body. Side by side, it's clear that more lightning does flash over the outside of the tube when it's wet. So when a person's clothes and body are wet, the path of the lightning is more likely to be over the surface rather than through the body. But how will this path change the damage generated by the current? At Manchester University, their scientific machinery has generated huge sparks to illustrate the voltage of a lightning bolt. But it's not the voltage that kills, it's the amps. That's what stops the heart. And it's at Cullum Electromagnetics where they can generate the killing power of lightning. 200,000 amps. Here they can test to see if a wet body will reduce the damage done by the current of lightning. First strike, how lightning can damage something that's dry. A fresh cut tree stump with dry bark is zapped with the current. It's clearly very destructive. Well, this is what we've got left. It's, uh, the whole room is, is littered with these shards of, of debris. And many of the bits have actually punctured the wall of the room and embedded themselves in the wall. So it's actually rather more dramatic than I, than I expected. But how will a stump be protected if it's wet? Second strike. A tree stump is wet round the outside to represent rain-soaked bodies. How will the current be diverted around the bark? Will this show how Michael escaped with his life? Clear evidence that the flashover on a wet surface really could have saved Michael. The wet trunk fares far better than the dry one. There is even a small amount of tearing to the bark, showing eerie similarities with survivors' clothes. They are torn to shreds. My clothes, we don't have, we never got. They, um, they said my shoes were blown off. My pants were kind of tattered. I know it blew my zipper open. So if you struck by lightning and you had wet clothing, then in many cases that is your salvation. It might damage your clothing. But as long as you're taking most of the current around the outside, then you may prevent hazardous currents being injected through your body. For Michael Utley, flashover may have been increased by his wet and sweaty body and the dangerous current reduced by over 99%. It may have protected him from some of the damaging effects of lightning, but enough current still passed through his body to do the most lethal thing it could. Stop his heart. I didn't think his chances of survival were very good. It was, for me, sort of like a battle type of situation. 
just seeing Mike lying on the green and realizing that there was some stuff we were going to have to do here. What did the boys do? How did they influence Michael's survival chances? I'm sure there's a direct correlation between what we did and the fact that he's here today. Former high-flying stockbroker Michael Utley has been on a quest to find out how he survived the massive strike of a lightning bolt. A bolt that blasted him with one billion watts, the energy of a large power station for one millisecond. Science has shown that most of the lightning's killer energy flashed over the outside of his body, but a small fraction of current still stopped his heart. Michael Utley survived. How? For the answers, maybe he needs to look closer to home. I would think that the type of person would make as much of a difference as the type of clothes, the type of lightning, that, where they stood, whether they're wet or dry, uh, because a body's chemistry, a body's makeup, the health of the individual, the cardiac status of the individual may have much more of an impact on how they're going to respond or survive after being hit by lightning than the lightning itself. Perhaps Michael's own body played a role in his survival that day. I was in pretty good shape before I got hurt. I was a skier, a windsurfer, um, bicycle, so I was in great shape. Campbell Gillespie was the same, another lightning survivor in his physical prime when he was struck. I've trained since I was 15. I used to ride the bike competitively. I did marathon running, did triathlons. I'm not the figure of a runner. Pound for pound, I could fairly shift, you know. For Campbell and Michael, fitness was an important part of their lives. When they were struck by lightning, it would become a crucial factor in their survival. He was just lying flat on his back, uh, no movement at all. He had no pulse, and certainly he wasn't breathing. When Michael Utley fell to the ground, the lightning had stopped his heart beating. It was unable to pump oxygen round his body and to his brain. There's not enough oxygen flow, there's irreversible brain damage, and even if you do get the heart started again, you may not like the result. Luckily, one of Michael's golfing mates was a trained first aider and knew what to do. I said to Bill, Billy, we've got a bad situation here. We've got to, we've got to do CPR on him. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation keeps the blood and oxygen circulating to the brain. I propped his head back, cleared his airway, and gave Bill instructions as to what to do once I started breathing for him. Campbell Gillespie's lightning bolt didn't stop his heart. When he fell, he swallowed his smashed teeth, blocking his airway. He stopped breathing. And he's watching the stomach breathe. And then it went still. And then I thought, no. Looked up, face has gone blue, lips have gone purple. And then I thought, we have a problem now. But again, Norman knew his first aid and knew what to do do that and get it into the solar plexus. Once that goes in, it forces the lungs up. Once, yes, twice. Mm, the third time I had to really, really push to move it. And then he started to breathe. Campbell and Michael's friends knew how to keep them going until the professionals arrived. Penny Fusco was the first paramedic on the scene with Michael. There were puddles everywhere. He was lying in a big puddle of water with him, the putter, and his friends. But what difference did his friends make? How important was the CPR that Bill and Dick carried out on Michael? Early CPR on a person struck by lightning doubles their chance of survival. He called me about eight months after his accident, and he thanked me, and I told him, I said, please don't thank me. I truly believe that the guys that he was with saved his life by performing early CPR. In the fight for survival after a lightning strike, ultimately it all comes down to one thing, the human body. Once you've been felled and your heart stopped, your survival relies on someone around to keep you breathing, and a fit heart that is strong enough to withstand extended CPR. The doctor said that training for as long as I had has helped me survive, because I hadn't been fit, I just uh, passed away there. I suppose you could say all that training wasn't about such and such a time. 
or a time trial time. It was, it was, I think it's prepared them for that day. A healthy person with a strong heart would probably have a better chance of survival. They would respond better to the CPR. Without the mouth-to-mouth -mouth and CPR, I might have lived, but not the way that anyone would want to. Michael's journey of discovery has revealed many things. He survived because he was wet and most of the lightning current flashed over his body. Enough current did enter his body to stop his heart, but by great good fortune, his golfing partners that day knew exactly what to do. Now he understands more about his assailant, Michael is happy to face it once again, from inside a protective metal cage. He knows lightning's power and appreciates just how lucky he is to be alive. It's kind of funny, I joke that, you know, I can get seats in restaurants now. Um, people move out of the way, oh, Mr. Utley, how, it's great, you know, why? I struck by lightning and I live. They, they, it's a huge, huge phenomenon to have happen and to survive.